So uh, welcome to the ARO seminar series session that is entitled uh, From Sound to Action Potentials, a Tour of the Inner Ear. Uh, so I'm John Ogle. I, I'm the moderator for today's webinar. And uh, I was asked just to make a few comments about myself. Uh, I'm an otologist. I'm a clinician scientist, and I'm also the department chair at USC in Los Angeles. The air here is starting to clear a little bit. It still smells like a campfire anytime you go outside. But uh, my eyes are no longer red and my throat is no longer itching. Um, so I got into the auditory field in medical school and my first exposure to Bill was when he gave a talk uh, when I was a medical student. He came up to Wisconsin for a mechanics of hearing conference, was, seemed like a week long conference, and he gave a talk there. And for me, it was the highlight of the, of the session. And he was talking about outer hair cell electromotility. And what came through was his enthusiasm uh, about science and how amazing um, the data was. And he was an incredibly clear and easy to understand presenter. I was lucky enough um, to take residency uh, in uh, Baylor College of Medicine where he had just moved so I could do a two-year postdoc uh, in research with him there. And then actually after doing uh, otology fellowship uh, in San Francisco, I went back to Baylor, took my first job as an assistant professor and Bill was my mentor for my KO8 grant. And so I had a lot of experience um, being trained under Bill. And I think that's where his strengths lie. Um, He's an incredible mentor. He's trained, not, I mean, besides me, several other uh, people in the field that are really true, uh, true leaders. Um, and the way he does it is he partners with the, the trainee. I mean, he's not your boss, he's your friend, and he's a partner in um, discovery. Um, his curiosity uh, about science and how things work um, is infectious. And his outside of the box thinking about how to develop new hypotheses and test them and what could be causing the phenomenon you discover or you see, you're, you're measuring, it's, it's outstanding. Um, frankly, the, I would say the, the thing I learned even more about, uh, you know, from him other than that was uh, how to write. I mean, Bill is an incredible writer. And every manuscript that we wrote together, I mean, we would read out loud from the beginning to the end and go through every single sentence and make sure it said everything it was supposed to say, nothing more, and then it was accurate. Um, so I am very uh, excited to be able to host this uh, webinar for you today. And I think you'll get to see some of what I was very lucky to be able to experience myself. And I'm just gonna um, go over some of his background here from, a, um, from what was given to me. So he's a, um, and I know this, of course, very well, too. <laughs> he's Professor Emeritus at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, um, where he held the Jake and Nina Kamen Chair of Otorhinolaryngology. And he previously held appointments at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, and the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, additionally, he spent two years teaching science and mathematics in Nigeria with the United States Peace Corps uh, between his undergraduate training in physics and graduate training uh, in physiology at the University of Chicago. He's a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America and a past president of the Association for Research in Laryngology. And his research focus is on the electromechanics of hearing. Um, before we get started today, I just wanna review a few of the tools that are available to you as an attendee, and they will be used throughout the presentation. So the tools are at the bottom of your screen and um, you're not supposed to use the chat function. You're supposed to use the, the question uh, function. And so you can um, type in your questions throughout the talk, but we're not gonna answer them until the end when there'll be a, a Q and A session and then I'll moderate through those. Um, but feel free to submit questions at any time and they'll be you know, stacked in order. And any questions that are not addressed during this session, we can answer them uh, or Bill will answer them in a follow-up email. Now, additionally, closed captioning is available for this webinar, and also the session is being recorded and so that you, you know, people could watch it again, or other people that missed this could watch it later. 
And so um, we hope you will also participate in our post webinar evaluation form. This is the first time ARO has ever done something like this. And we wanna gather feedback and continue to improve this process. We've had an incredible um, uh, turnout uh, today. And if you're having any technical difficulty, please email ARO for assistance. And the email is headquarters at ARO.org. And now without any uh, further delay, uh, Bill, please. Well, thank you, John. And hello to all the ARO members and guests who are spread out around the world. Um, we've come a long way from the early days of ARO down in St. Pete's Beach at the Happy Dolphin. Uh, so those of you who are old enough to remember those days, you will can share the enthusiasm I have for trying this, this new venue. Um, with, I do have some trepidations. I transitioned to emeritus status uh, in January at the beginning of the year, and I was making a gradual uh, trans accommodation, getting into a new groove, more relaxed groove with the laboratory when the world changed. And hello, lockdown, okay? I talk about cultural shock. I, I think I gained a great deal from the Peace Corps in terms of being able to make some kind of an adaptation to the transition to the pandemic lockdown mode. So, so it's, it, it's been bizarre. Retirement is totally bizarre, let me tell you. So without, uh, with now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I intend to do in, in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes. And as the title says, I'm going to give you a tour of the inner ear. I'm going to describe how sound is converted to action potentials, which is the task of the, of the cochlea. And uh, in order to appreciate that, it's good to look at the inner ear. So here we have the inner ear over here. And this portion I'm already going to talk about. It's a vast intellectual territory. And there's just too much to uh, compress into 45 minutes for anybody. So what I'm going to do is exclude a lot of it. I'm not going to be talking too much about this mechanotransduction system, which is the vestibular apparatus, which uh, allows for maintaining your head in space or detecting the position of your head in space and accelerations. And uh, instead, what I'm going to focus on are the outpouchings that came about, this, this structure came, is common in all vertebrates. So even 400 million years ago, the, the semicircular canals and the, and the uh, otolithic organs were present. But one of these, the saccule, had an outpouching in, in development and it became a rudimentary or early hearing organ for many of the verte early vertebrates. Uh, and it wasn't until mammals came along that it obtained this spiral shape that is now known as the cochlea. In the human, it's two and a half turns, going from high frequencies at the base to very low frequencies at the apex. And that's, that's in terms of the maximum sensitivity. We'll, we'll discuss that in more detail. But what the cochlea is going to be doing is converting the information that is in the sound and transmitting it to the brain via the auditory portion, portion of the eighth nerve. And that's what's happening there. So I'm going to start the tour by following the path that I took through the inner ear. And uh, it started, my path started with action potentials. So I'm going to go to action potentials. And so I began in the brainstem of the cat. And my, my earliest experiences were with, with Jay Goldberg. Uh, as a training exercise, he, uh, we, I sat in with an experiment that he was in, involved in at the time that was recording from neurons in the anterior ventral cochlear nucleus. And then at his suggestion, I started studying the projection neurons from those axons as they coursed ventrally and into a fiber bundle that crosses the midline in something called a trapezoid body. So I was recording from trapezoid body fibers. 
these trapezoid body fibers were coming from a specific cell, cell types, the so-called spherical bushy cells and the globular bushy cells. And these are relay nuclei that are conveying the information coming in from the auditory nerve uh, and, and transmitting it rapidly and precisely to preserve the temporal information so that the superior olivary complex here at the, the base of the, of the medulla can uh, uh, process the binaural information that's coming in and specifically the cues that are necessary for uh, detecting interaural time intensity differences for spatial localization of sound sources. And here's some of the recordings that I made. I spent hours looking at this, uh, presenting different sounds, going through the response area of the cell at various frequencies and intensities. And I became, uh, I was always enamored as, uh, as to the capabilities of these neurons to uh, code for the frequency and uh, intensity of the, of the sounds that were being presented. And this particular slide shows one of the abilities of the auditory system, and that is to phase lock. And this is the auditory stimulus, this 1,000 cycle per second, uh, uh, one kilohertz sound. And you can see that these action potentials are occurring at a fixed position in the stimulus sinusoid, and that's called phase locking. And at, in, in order, and it also was faithfully reproducing the response areas of the, of the auditory nerve. So it was doing a good job, but it, I didn't appreciate until 20 years later when uh, Phil Joris did a study, again, recording from the fibers in the trapezoid body and confirming much of what I had seen, but also showing that there was an a enhancement of these neurons in their phase locking ability and something he called an entrainment index over what was present in the auditory nerve. So here's a auditory nerve, uh, coll a collection of auditory nerve uh, fibers and their entrainment index over a large range. And here are the ones that are in the trapezoid body. So you can see that the central nervous system is enhancing and, uh, and, and facilitating the, the uh, encoding of this information so that it can be used by these structures. As I was doing this, I had to go back to learn more about how the inner ear was taking the, the information and processing it. And in the, in the due course, I became in love with these synaptic ribbons, these hair cells uh, uh, synapses at the base that synapse onto the uh, cochlear spiral ganglion cells onto the afferent terminals. And they feature a prominent electron dense uh, ribbon, it's all called a synaptic ribbon surrounded by vesicles. And somehow they are uh, part of the, the process by which the neurotransmitter is released in response to the deflection of these elements up here, which are the stereocilia. And we'll get back to those. But it's key to remember that the hair cell does not have, in the adult and mature hair cell, does not have action potentials. So it's not like a neuron, which is releasing neurotransmitter in response to a roughly 80 to 100 millivolt event that it, in the action potential, but rather it is a graded response encoding the intensity by the amount of neurotransmitter that's released and thereby setting up the train of action potentials that are going into the brainstem. But these synaptic ribbons are, are beautiful things to look at. And here are a collection of them as published in a, a recent uh, review article by Moser et al, Tobias, a member of ARO. Uh, uh, but you can see the synaptic ribbons that are in a, a rod photoreceptor in, in, the, in the retina, in the rod bipolar cells, and here in an inner hair cell. And the serial sections that they have made, uh, been making of these structures allow them to make these cartoons, which show the electron dense core of the synaptic ribbon, the halo of vesicles that are around it ready to be released. And this is in en face 
and this is turned 90 degrees, so you can see it. And these are the spiral ganglion neuron afferents. Um, we'll talk about the sound entering, and I'm not going to do much more than show this particular uh, slide, which shows in a cartoon form the pressure waves of the sound coming in, setting the eardrum into motion, causing the uh, bones of the middle ear to vibrate, and then transmitting the energy to the fluid-filled inner ear. So that's one of the features of the inner ear. It is fluid-filled. So when we go in on our tour of the inner ear, keep in mind that we're, uh, we don't have a scuba equipment. We're just uh, cruising along in, in a, some kind of a aquatic environment, more, much like sea salt. So we're going to take a close look at the cochlea. And here you have a cochlea that's been dissected out of the otic capsule. Uh, again, showing the turns. We're, we're going to now look at one turn of this in cross section. And this is going to appear. And you're going to see that it is comprised of three chambers. It's been turned uh, so that the uh, crown jewel, the organ of Corti, is now in a horizontal position, which is classically portrayed as, but it really is mounted on its side in the ear. And any, in any case, you have fluids in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani, which are uh, called peri, which is called perilymph, and it's very much like the cerebral spinal fluid that is bathing the neurons of the brain and is in, in fact connected to the brain by canals. The scala media, it contains a magical fluid called endolymph. The endolymph is unique because it is, uh, uh, has an unusual composition. It is high in potassium and, uh, and uh, low in sodium. It also has a modest amount of calcium in it, which is important for function. And we'll get back to that in a little bit. But looking more closely at the crown uh, of jewels, it's the organ of Corti, and this is a cross section. So here you can see the eighth nerve. Here you can see uh, the uh, 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 Rosenthal's canal. It has the auditory nerve fibers, the bipolar uh, ganglion cells that innervate the base of the, the hair cells and transmit the information into the brain. These are the so-called outer hair cells, and these are the inner hair cells. And we're going to come back to them in greater detail after first looking at the um, anatomy of the hair cell and the, the functional components that it has. I've already mentioned the stereocilia. This is a hair cell from the vestibular system. It is, and you know it's from the vestibular system because it shows a kind of cilium. The kind of cilium is shown here in a transmission electron micrograph in a cross section. It resembles a motile cilium in that it has the nine by two microtubule organization, a characteristic of motile cilia. Uh, the, uh, the important structure is a postulated uh, transduction channel, which is uh, located at the tip of the of the stereocilia, and it is where the ions uh, go in and out. So it has an open probability, and if the open probability is greater, you're going to have more, more ions going through. If, it, if the open probability is less, you're going to have fewer transition, uh, being transmitted. In the rest of the hair cell, you have uh, voltage and uh, ion, uh, gated ion channels that are in the soma. And down here is the synapse again. Once again, the synaptic ribbon uh, innervating or terminating on the afferent terminal, releasing the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and causing a depolarization of the afferent terminal and ultimately the initiation of action potentials. Some hair cells in, uh, in the vestibular system and in the outer hair cells uh, receive efferent fibers from neurons that are located deep in the brainstem. These come out and they release neurotransmitters that modulate the gain and function of the hair cells themselves. So uh, with, we go on from there 
And we look at, at greater detail at the transduction process. And this is showing the response of, a, again, a vestibular hair cell to a mechanical stimulus that is controlled where they can bend the stereocilia uh, in the excitatory direction, uh, which causes an increase in an inward current. Notice that at the holding potential, there is a baseline current. So there is an increase in that uh, 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 depolariz depolarization that's coming from the influx of potassium and calcium. And then at the, at the end, when it is relaxed, it, it comes back. There's been an adaptation process, but not all the way. And then when you bend it in the opposite direction, you'll get a decrease in the current as the open probability of these transduction channels are uh, reduced. And this basically shows what happened at the various points. The depolarization, adaptation, and repolarization, and uh, driving it to the zero uh, that's maintained by the holding potential. So you may be asking what's with the sodium and, and calcium, because anybody who's studying the neurophysiology of neurons is, knows that the action potentials are generally uh, it brought it into being because of the influx of sodium, but that's not the case here. So what is doing this? It's the silent current. And specifically, I'm going to call out this structure, the stria vascularis. We can have uh, a, a, over an hour symposium on the stria vascularis and the ion pumps that maintain the, um, maintain the fluids that are coming into the scale of media. And it, it is setting up a current that uh, we um, monitored using techniques that um, Paul Manis had uh, developed in the lab uh, studying the laminated structure of the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So he did a current density analysis where a electrode is inserted. It stops at, at a given point is it, uh, the uh, response to an evoked uh, a, a stimulus is given in our case in the cochlea it was sound in Paul's case it was an electrical shock uh, or in some cases sound uh, but it, you know, but what you do is you record at this point you advance 10 microns record at this point another 10 microns so you're getting potentials at all of these fixed locations separated by 10 microns and knowing what the conductivity of the fluid is, you can calculate the current that is passing between the two points. And with that, we were able to, uh, namely Mike Zidanek and George Spiro and, uh, and Paul and myself were able to identify the fact that there was a steady state current that was coming through at, and when we assumed that as this was the knowledge then that most of the uh, pathways for the conduction is, is particularly at low intensities are coming through the outer hair cells. Knowing that there were about 12,000 of these, we were able to uh, estimate the current that was flowing through and we estimated it to be about 500 picoamps. And stimulation in the excitatory direction, namely pushing when the organ of cordy was going upwards, would double that. So it would go to 1,000 picoamps. And then stimulation in the opposite direction, namely with the basilar membrane going down, would drive it to zero so that you would get it. So it would told us that at the resting position, and this was in, uh, in vivo preparation, the resting position was roughly at 50% open probability. And this information was dramatically verified about five years ago in the Fetoplace laboratory, uh, where they confirmed the 500 picoamp current is, is the most likely ability, uh, uh, current that's flowing through the cell. Uh, and, we, and we called it at the time the silent current because there's a similar standing current in the retina, uh, which is called the dark current. So in, in, a, in uh, correspondence to that, we call it the silent current. And the silent current is what powers transduction. And then it's going to power something uh, called the cochlear amplifier, which we'll get to in a little bit. So going back to the organ of Cordy uh, with, a, with another cartoon, uh, this is again in my fascination with 
the, the structure of this, I became interested in the fact that there were three times as many of these outer hair cells as there were inner hair cells. As I said, about 12,000 of the outer hair cells and about 3,000 of the inner hair cells. So what's the difference? Uh, why do we have three of one? And, and look at this, There's, it's surrounded by fluid. You have one micron spaces between adjacent outer hair cells. And this is very unusual. Uh, the, the brain, the neurons are separated by tens of nanometers. Uh, the muscles in the, in the heart are by the same amount. So you know, generally uh, the structures in the body abhor a, a large space, yet here is a space that is obviously serving some function because the developmental process that uh, was required to, to arrive at it was uh, tedious and filled, as we now know, with lots of signaling molecules. Uh, we may hear more about that from Sharon Stone in when she gives her presentation later in the seminar series. Um, the inner hair cell, being only one, looks to be weird until I went back into the literature and realized that Heinrich Heinlein had, had given us the answer to the question uh, back in 1966, well before I got here. Uh, Spondlin was a otolaryngologist. He was the chairman of his department in Austria at Innsbruck. Uh, and in a uh, magnificent study where he did a serial sections of the uh, organ of Corti and particularly the synaptic organization of the organ of Corti, he was able to reconstruct the, uh, the synaptic organization and he showed that 95% of the fibers that come from the spiral ganglia in Rosenthal's canal come out and terminate on the inner hair cells. So this means that most of the information that is getting to the brain is coming from the inner hair cell. What then are the outer hair cells doing? Because he showed that they come from another spiral ganglion cell. It's, he called them the spiral ganglion cell two. And they go out, they turn basalward, cross the, the tunnel of Corti between the inner and outer hair cells, and then continue spiraling for about 600 microns, where they will terminate on up to 15 to 20 outer hair cells. And so if you're a neurologist or a, a neuroscientist, you'd say, well, it's easy. You're going to be able to record from those spiral ganglion cell twos, even though there's only 5%. And you should be able to see a population of, of, of uh, fibers that are responding in a greatly different way than the, the type one uh, uh, spiral ganglion cells that are innervating the inner hair cell. So uh, the problem was that years went by and years went by and nobody recorded any acoustically evoked responses from the spiral ganglion cell type two. There's some hints now from Hopkins, from uh, Hughes, the Fuchs lab uh, that there are uh, that the cell outer hair cells can release neurotransmitters and excite the afferent terminals in response to acoustic trauma. In other words, very loud, damaging sound that releases ATP from the damaged cells can cause an excitation of these neurons. So that's an interesting possibility for the future investigations as to what they're doing. But now let's put it back on top of the basilar membrane and look at the mechanics of the basilar membrane. And the mechanics of the basilar membrane were early described by von Beckesche back uh, before World War II and during World War II. Looking at human cadavers, he was able to visualize using stroboscopic illumination, the movement of a traveling wave that originated first in the high frequency regions of the cochlea and traversed to low frequency regions, reaching a, depending upon where you're looking at with, or the stimulus that you're giving, reaching a, magnus, a, a maximum. So high frequency stimuli would cause a maximum down here and low frequency stimuli would uh, cause a similar, what, By the way, this is not a spiral, it's what would look like if you uncoiled the spiral. So this is up near the top of the, of the cochlea, uh, far away from the entry of the 
uh, energy into the oval window and the release valve here. And, they, and remember, it's fluid filled. So hydrodynamic models and mechanical models could replicate von Bekeshe's traveling wave. But it, the problem with it was it was too broad to account for the narrow tuning that was observed in the auditory nerve. And that was until better imaging techniques came about in, that allowed people to go in like Bill Rohde and uh, other members of the ARO uh, where they could uh, look at with more precision and with greater resolution. And they were able to show that with each improvement of resolution and each improvement in the viability of the preparation, in other words, making it more normal in its response properties, these, these uh, traveling waves became as narrow at their peak as it would be required in order to get the acoustic nerve responses that are so uh, very narrow. Uh, so it looked as if there was, and it, what was ultimately shown was that if you had one of a really nice preparation, really narrow tuning in terms of the mechanics, and you killed the animal, it, the, the traveling wave returned to the uh, description uh, that Van Beckshire had given years ago. So, so there's something vulnerable about what's happening in the cochlea and in the organ of Corti that is affecting the traveling wave. And this is it. This is the, the outer hair cell. This is the function of the outer hair cell is to, is to uh, counteract the forces that would normally give rise to those broad tuning curves and to enhance the sensitivity of the system. So what I've got here is an, an outer hair cell that has been dissected. And in this case, it was dissected by John Ogilvy and it was dissected out of a guinea pig. Uh, we had done this in Geneva when I was on sabbatical uh, back in uh, the early 80s. Uh, and we continued to look at it, uh, to investigate it. But this was a recording that was made on, uh, using uh, the good old tape deck. And this is a patch clamp that has been uh, attached to the base of the outer hair cell. Here you can see the stereocilia. And what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate it, or John is going to stimulate it with a uh, pulse that's about 200 milliseconds long. So what we've got is a situation where each pulse is going to be uh, 60 millivolts in magnitude. It's going to be a 200 millisecond duration. And the first one is going to be hyperpolarizing and each successive pulse is going to be 10 millivolts more depolarizing. So it's going to be hyperpolarizing, going to go larger potentials uh, initially, and then they're going to be depolarized. They're going to go back through the holding potential, and then uh, it's going to become massive uh, in terms of going even more depolarized. So here's... Okay, so just in case you missed it, let's go through it one more time. You'll, you'll note that initially the direction of the movement is elongation. And then each successive thing, the elongation gets shorter as it goes back down to the holding potential. And then when it passes through the holding potential, it becomes, uh, the cell begins to shorten and contract. Right now. Elongation, holding potential. Depolarization and then massive contractions, shortening. Okay, so that is the electromotility, and this is what has been called the cochlear amplifier. So, what do we mean by the cochlear amplifier? Well, first of all, let's describe it quantitatively a little bit better. Here's a data from Joe Santos, Saki, and if, if you have the holding potential somewhere around here. You can see that as we go to hyperpolarizing values, you're getting elongation. And as you go from that to depolarizing values, you're going to get a shortening. So you're getting elongation plus and minus. So what is this a function of? Well, there were a number of studies that were done. Joe did a, a, a brilliant study where he changed ionics concentrations inside and outside 
the the outer hair cell uh, re, re, so that he could reverse the uh, and by changing ionic composition he could reverse the current and there was no change in the movements the movements followed the voltage it's independent of calcium you can add calcium or take away calcium the cells didn't like this they were very unhappy but nevertheless they would still continue to mo move and they were independent of atp you could block uh, glycolytic or oxidative phosphorization and you would still get uh, uh, movement as long as you gave the, the uh, uh, electrical stimulus. They do depend upon Preston and small anions, and I'm going to shout that out as a, another massive territory, uh, but I'm not going to spend that much time on it. Uh, uh, I'm going to continue on and look more closely at the voltage uh, relationship. So the main thing is the voltage in the terms of determining the, the change in length, whether it's a hyperpolarizing or depolarizing voltage. Uh, one of the more remarkable studies was done by uh, Frank in the Gummer Laboratory in Tübingen, uh, where they took a atomic force microscope cantilever, turned it upside down and used it as a calibrated um, mechanical, mechanical sensor so they could measure the movement of the make small displacements of the cantilever as it's pushing against the top of a hair cell, outer hair cell that is inserted into a micro chamber, and then they can electrically stimulate this. And they found that as they went from uh, uh, 200 cycles all the way up to 80 uh, kilohertz, they could get a response. The remarkable thing, it was a constant phase almost all the way at least to 80 kilohertz. So, this is an incredible mechanical transducer, the outer hair cell. You, if you tried to buy a speaker that would perform this for your hi-fi system, you can't find them. You have to have several different speakers that uh, span either the bass, you know, the woofer down here, uh, and the tweeters that are coming in and here, and then the intermediate uh, speakers that are in this region. And even then you're going to have some holes so you need an equalizer in order to accommodate. But this is being done by the cell uh, in response to a constant stimulus, constant magnitude stimulus of different frequency. So it's a truly remarkable cell. And what is it doing? Well, we know the system is tuned. Von Bekeshe showed us that. We knew that different portions of it respond best to different frequencies because these are, uh, uh, you know, if, if you play a musical instrument, you can understand how the basilar membrane is tuned. You've got long fibers in the apex and short fibers in the base. So it's narrower in the base and it's wider in the, in the apex. And the tension is changing. So it, it means that it's going to get your, your low frequencies towards the base. Well, we're all familiar with a tuned device, namely the swing. And the swing is, has a natural frequency. It has a preferred frequency, which your mom or dad uh, knew about and would push you at in order to minimize their effort because they could pump energy in, in phase with your swinging and you would go farther and further. In time, you became bored with having to have your parents around or somebody else push you and you learned that you could do the same thing by kicking. And so by kicking, you, as long as you did it at the natural frequency of the swing, you could get the swing to go very high and very far. And you would delight at, at getting large swings and then jumping off at the end of the swing. But you were, because of the people you are, you were naturally curious about what was going on and you tried to kick at different frequencies. And when you did, you soon discovered that you disturbed the, the smooth swinging action of the swing. In fact, you could kick it opposite to phases to get it to attenuate uh, in order to uh, slow down as it was necessary. So what's the purpose? Why, does, why is, do you have this cochlear amplifier? Well, the reason is that that fluid-filled environment that the organ of Cordy finds itself in. So uh, this is a, a portrait of a cutaway of, of the organ of Cordy in the cochlea. And as you go from the apex to the base, the frequency is increasing. This is 
the scale of uh, vestibular is scale of tympani, perilymph. This is scale of media with the uh, unusual ionic env uh, environment and the standing current. Uh, but the outer hair cells are here doing their thing, and they're doing it in order to counteract the viscous dampening. What do we mean by viscous dampening? Well, you're, you're all familiar with that as well. It's Friday night, uh, you're at a friend's house in pre-pandemic days, and you're both in the hot tub. So you're in the hot tub, and you're moving your hands slowly through the water, and it's easy to move it through the water. But then you get frisky and you're going to splash some water at that person and you hit the water hard and you notice that the water resists your hand very much. And that's because the force of the viscous damping force is proportional to the velocity of the structure that's moving through the water. And so what is happening here is if you didn't have the cochlear amplifier, you wouldn't be able to get to the higher frequencies in the first place because the, you wouldn't get differential vibrations of the structures within the organ of Cordy as you go to the higher frequency because of the viscous dampening would cut it out. So what the outer hair cells are doing is essentially making a system that is accommodating for the viscous dampening. Here's an equation that is uh, monitoring it. So you're getting the force that is driving it. This is the elastic restoring force. This is the viscous damping force, it's proportional velocity, and the classic Newton's mass times acceleration that is, is also acting upon the structures. And this is the bad guy, the viscous damping force. So we want to get rid of it, and that's what the outer hair cell is doing. It's getting rid of it. It's, it's introducing energy that directly counteracts the viscous dampening. So it allows for high frequency response and precise responses and rapid responses at low intensity. So you essentially have a situation that drives the excitation of the inner hair cells, but it essentially is giving you 3,000 swings that are activating the 3,000 inner hair cells. And just to show you what happens when this is damaged, the, uh, you, you'll get a the normal system, which has a normal complement of outer hair cells and inner hair cells, and then you'll get the damaged system, which uh, in which the outer hair cells are not present, or you block the uh, cochlear amplifier by other means. Uh, Mario Ruggiero has measured the movements, and when he does that, he shows that it, for the living organ in in his preparations, you'll get for it, for every 10 dB, in, in, every 40 dB increase, you'll get a 10 dB increase here in the, in the vibrations. So you get a four to one compression. This allows the organ to respond over a great dynamic range. So this sound pressure level uh, it shows one of the features of the cochlear amplifier. You also can block it using aspirin. If you take too much aspirin, you know that this affects your ability to hear. Uh, and this shows in vivo, in vitro, what happens. You start in a control situation, which is normal, and you're moving through a voltage range of stimulation. And we're going to then bathe the hair cell with salicylate, salicylic acid, aspirin, and this is a puff application. And I invite you to try and find a, a, uh, a motion that's going on now. So you've blocked the electromotility. So this is, uh, was shown earlier in behavioral studies uh, in steel mills in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, 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 Dr. Meyer uh, uh, recorded from this patient who had a hearing loss, a, a so-called acoustic notch, because he worked in the steel mills and it, he had a notch at four, uh, thousand or four kilohertz, which was not uncommon for, for the, uh, because of the noise trauma that was being induced in the steel mills. So this is before, and then he gave the, the subject salicylate, and this is what he could hear afterwards. And you could see it goes down to where the notch was. So it looks like the salicylate normally is blocking this portion, which the normal hearing is giving here, 
but in a case where it's the, the outer hair cells are missing, you're getting a, uh, a you're going down to that particular level. So this is just confirming that. So the mechanism is in the plasma membrane, the years of study uh, that went into it and that voltage uh, sensitivity meant that it had to be in the membrane because that's where the largest potential gradient is. The largest potential gradient is across the membrane because the membrane is so thin. It is only five nanometers thin. And so if you had a, say a hundred millivolts across it, that would give you a, a, a potential gradient of about 100 megavolts per meter. The lightning has less than that, has about 10 millivolts per meter. So, so the conduction, uh, the conductivity of the air would, only allows for uh, uh, the, the, the lightning, whereas the membrane, which is made of lipids, is very, very uh, 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 insulating. So it's a hydrostat. It's got a positive, the cell has a positive pressure. I think you could tell that from the images. And it's got an unusual uh, lateral wall. This is going to be quick. The lateral wall has three parts. It's got a membrane, a folded uh, plasma membrane. It's got a, a complicated uh, subsurface cisternae that lies beneath it. And in between the two is the only cortical, uh, the only actin cytoskeleton that the cell has. In normal cells, there's the actin is depolymerized in the central core. Uh, the cytoskeleton is orthotropic. It has a cortical lattice that is, uh, has actin, which goes around the cell circumferentially, and it has spectrin, which is going more or less uh, uh, longitudinally in, in the cell, axially in the cell. And this cartoon uh, is showing the same thing. So you have the actin circumferentially, the spectrin going uh, axially, and, uh, and then some pillars that uh, join the membrane to the, to the uh, cytoskeleton. A more recent update to show using electron microscopic tomography by Truffo and uh, Raphael and Auer uh, shows a, a more refined update showing that the pillars are thinner than what I portrayed in those early shows and they are firm and, this, and the actin is firmly anchored by some anchoring proteins that are not known. The subsurface cisternae becomes more intriguing because it has a paracrystalline structure within it and the smooth membranes on both, both sides. So this is my vision of what is happening as the cell elongates and shortens. As it shortens, it's like an accordion. You're getting a, um, you're getting a compression and a folding so you get a maximum folding as it's, it's going back and forth. And uh, this is what we think is doing this is something called flexoelectricity. This is when uh, the voltage changes, you'll get a change in the bending modulus, which causes the object to uh, bend. And this is named after piezoelectricity. It's the bending that comes from flexing. And you have a direct uh, 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 form of this, just like piezoelectric events go in both directions. If you squeeze it, you'll get a voltage difference. If you uh, electrically stimulate a piezoelectric, you'll get strain. Uh, the same thing with, with uh, when you uh, get direct flexoelectricity by actually moving this. And this is uh, in Iwasa's lab. Uh, he showed that if you caused elongation but here you'll get currents that are flowing uh, in response to the uh, uh, elongation and shortening of the of the outer hair cell. So there are non-mammals that have cochlear amplifiers but no outer hair cells but they do have autoacoustic emissions. Their hair cells do not have somatic motility. The amplifier is postulated to originate in the stereocilia and a form of electromotility adaptation occurs in hair cell stereocilia bundles. We've uh, modeled that uh, as a flexoelectric process. And I won't go into details uh, about it because we're running short of time and I wanna leave some time for Q and A, but uh, uh, Rick 
So analysis was able to sh predict the stereociliar length change as you go from the base with short stereocilia to uh, the uh, apex with the long stereocilia. Uh, it's able to do that. He did this with a uh, power efficiency analysis. Um, and we had previously, he based a lot of the, the ideas based on our uh, optical tweezer studies where we were able to pull uh, uh, membrane tethers that and drive them with uh, electrical stimuli and show that they create force that goes to high frequencies, uh, that they are also present in HEK stereocilia, and that uh, salicylate also uh, attenuates the response of, of these uh, tether operations. Uh, we more recently studied this uh, and published it in last year uh, and added accessory mass and, exclusive and explicitly included cationic influence through the mechanoelectrical transduction channels. And this came up with a critical limit cycle, which is for the Cognoscenti is something that uh, uh, is important. It's a nonlinear process, which uh, Jim Hutzpeth has demonstrated uh, is capable of, in theory, uh, giving the compression ratios that Mario Ruggiero uh, accommodated. And so this gives rise to my final slide, and it's, it, it's a, one of the wild ideas. It, it talks about the evolution of the outer hair cell. And it points out that both the lateral wall here with the trilaminar organization and the stereocilia bundle share a common cytoarchitecture. You have the plasma membrane of the stereocilia. You have an actin, actin and where actin is dominating the structure. You have a, a, a spectrum filled a cuticular plate. Then you have a, a, a cisternal system that's just underneath the uh, uh, cuticular plate. And this is contiguous with the subsurface cisternae of the lateral wall. So I'm thinking that in evolution, you had electromotility occurring in the stereocilular bundle that gave you the nonlinear processes, gave you a cochlear amplifier before mammals. But when mammals came along needing to go to higher frequencies, it was looking for more real estate uh, in order to expand the amplification process. So it took the stereocilular structure, which is based on the actin, which is circumferential going around the cell and cut the stereocilia in, stereocilia in half and laid it down on the lateral wall, still maintaining the subsurface cisternae and underneath it. So this is the, the final slide. And I'd like to thank everybody uh, that contributed to the work, but that would be a list that would be too packed and too dense to make out individual names. So I'm going to leave you on a happy note and wish you a happy new year uh, because Rosh Hashanah is tomorrow and we need a change. So with that, I'm pushing on. Okay, Q&A. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. That was wonderful. Um, so the outer hair cell is a big stereocilia? <laughs> no, it's a collection of stereocilia. It's thousands of stereocilia that are wrapped around the, uh, the, oh my. the, the cylinder. Well, there's a few uh, comments coming in uh, uh, with thanks for the, for the very nice talk. I, I have a question while we're waiting for more to come in. Okay. So I mean, if you were just starting out today in science, starting your career, uh, what would you think would be the hot areas to get into? What are the, how do you build a career in this field now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I think the, the, the quantum engineering is, is where a lot of it's at because in order to improve our resolution down to that level, we're going to have to understand what's happening there. All of these magical things that are coming in and helping artificial intelligence and computers are going to also help the measuring devices. So I think a, a, 
somebody would ha also have to take that into account and uh, use it to adapt uh, new tools to the, the new age. That is very, very true. I, I, there's very, I mean, if you think about the degree of movements of this bundle, for example, nanometers, right? Yeah. Um, that's at the atomic level. And there's very little uh, modeling of, of that. Let's see, a couple questions. What role does electromotility play in the generation of autoacoustic emissions? Oh, well, okay. I would say it plays a, a major role. <laughs> what are, what's the origin of the, uh, of the uh, electromotility, whether it's outer hair cells or stereocilia, because the autoacoustic emissions are in non-mammals. Uh, so there is something that is producing the same nonlinear events that give rise to the cochlear emissions. So it's coming from this industry. Uh, the, the easy example of that is you just reduce the energy sources in both cases and the autoacoustic emissions go away. Yeah, let's see. Do, oh, very nice talk. Do hair cells get hot when they work out? <laughs> I guess <laughs> our outer hair cells generating heat. <laughs> well, uh, one would expect it to because there are there are, uh, there are, there's work in axons, which are also, also motile. Axons twitch when the action potential goes by, and they, they've been shown to generate heat. So that hasn't really been examined carefully enough in the organ of Cordy and in the outer hair cells, but it's entirely possible. Hmm. How do voltage-gated ion channel activity follow the high-frequency movements? There's a recent paper that uh, came out of uh, Ebenezer Yamala's lab and, uh, Rick, and, and Rick Rabbit, uh, where they showed the KNCQ channels are mechanically sensitive. So if, if you had a mechanically sensitive, uh, and we know the KCNQ channels are in the outer hair cell. So if you had those channels that are being driven by these hydrostatic forces, then you could easily imagine that their opening and closing would be as fast as would be necessary to change the conductance of the outer hair cell at the base and thereby allow that those hundreds of picoamp currents even at high frequencies. Oh, oh that's good. Uh, let's see, some species of bats operate at 15 to 220 kilohertz, which must push the system to its upper limit? There's not really a question there, but do you have any comments on bad hearing? It's a fascinating field. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Right. And what, one problem is I've, I've never seen a good uh, rendering of the subsurface cisternia in bats. So hmm. I'm, I'm even wondering if it's there. Hmm. Uh, you know, there, there, there may be other modifications that we'd have to go to quantum mechanics in order to, to find out the, the answer to that. That's good. Let's see. Uh, incredible talk. Thank you so much. What is the role of the outer hair cells in generating spontaneous activity of the eighth nerve? Uh, probably none. <laughs> <laughs> that probably goes back to the fact that you have uh, a standing current, some of which is going to be uh, going through the inner hair cell, and that's going to be uh, causing the spontaneous activity just by, by virtue of having the standing current going through it. And because that's going to be giving a tonic release of neurotransmitter and that's modulated by the bending of the stereocilia. Mm -hmm. that, that's one of the nice things about hair cells. A hair cell is being stimulated one way and the other. Mm -hmm. And so you have the spontaneous activity, which when it increases, you know it's bending this way. But then when it's decreasing, you know that's being bent that way. <laughs> so it's giving, it's giving you information right then and there because there is a spontaneous activity. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's four o'clock, but I want to ask this last question because it's a really good one. Um, if the hair bundle retains um, the ability to uh, maintain the amplifier since it has membranes with actin, why did the, ma I guess he's saying basically if there's stereocilia motility, why did, the, why did mammals evolve electromotility? I, I thought I went through that. Yeah, I think you did, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, just, you just cut it in half 
You wrap it around, <laughs> you have thousands of them together, and you get a, they're operating in concert. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're pretty good here. Wow, there's a lot of questions. You're, you're going to have a lot of emailing to do afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, boy, that was just wonderful. And especially for the um, trainees and young investigators out there, you know, this is, this is really how this got started. And I, I personally want to thank them for organizing this and, and inviting you to talk because it's a great, a great start to this series. And I'm really looking forward to all the rest of them too. Thanks to everybody for attending.